Good evening and welcome to the Thursday, March 14th, 2019 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm uh, David Narkowitz, the uh, chair of the committee, and I will begin by asking the clerk to call the roll. David Narkowitz? Present. Molly Burnham? Present. Here. Flora Fallon? Present. Zan Hennessy? Present. Shalon Hoffman? Present. Donna Meyer, Mr. Howard Moore, here. Susan Goss, present. Thank you very much. Um, I do want to just let the public know that this meeting is being um, audio and video recorded by Northampton Community Television. And um, the first uh, an item on the agenda is the public comment period. Um, I believe we have a sign up sheet. I would just ask that uh, folks who have signed up to speak, if when you come to the podium, if you could just identify yourself, your name and address, and, um, and then I will have a timer uh, of three minutes. Um, and I would just ask you to try to keep your remarks to three minutes so that everyone has the equal opportunity to speak. Uh, the first person who has signed up is Laurel Davis Delano. Hello. Um, so I'll repeat this, but I'm Laurel Davis Del Delano. Um, I'm a professor of sociology, and I live at 102 Ridgewood Terrace in Northampton. And I have a child who went K through 12 through the public schools in Northampton. Um, I study uh, representations of Native Americans in US popular culture. And most recently, I was on a team of academic researchers who studied this topic as part of the Reclaiming Native Truth Project managed by First Nations um, Development Institute and Echo Hawk Consulting. Um, so I'm here to speak about um, eliminating Columbus Day. Um, there's much evidence that Col Christopher Columbus engaged in murder torture, enslavement, and other forms of exploitation against indigenous people when he came to what is called the Americas. From the perspective of many indigenous people who live in North, Central, and South America, Columbus is perceived as the first colonizer or among the first colonizers who began their suffering. Columbus began the genocide of indige indigenous people in many parts of the Americas, um, including loss of indigenous societies, loss of indigenous land, loss of indig indigenous ways of life, loss of indigenous control over their own societies, and the like. As a result of their historic and present day experiences, Native Americans in the US have the highest rates of, uh, have higher rates of poverty, physical health problems, mental health problems, as well as lower levels of education and the like. Inequality and injustices faced by categories of people are related to representations of these categories and related to these categories. In other words, representations and beliefs are intertwined with and interact with material concrete um, conditions. In recent years, indigenous people who live in the boundaries of the United States, as well as indigenous people in other parts of the Americas, have been leading a movement to provide accurate information about to the public about Columbus, as well as about colonization more generally. As part of this movement, they rightly claim that although we should recognize Columbus as playing a major role in history, we should definitely not celebrate this role because it is historic, it's horrifically oppressive via Columbus Day statues and the like. When we do this, we are celebrating the colonization and oppres oppression of ind indigenous people in the Americas. And when we are doing this, we send a message to indigenous people that we don't care about them and we are creating a hostile climate for indigenous people. Thus, unless you eliminate Columbus Day, you are sending this message and creating a hostile climate. Those of us who are not indigenous, but who want to support indigenous people, need to be sensitive to their experiences. Beyond that, we need to recognize that there are a small number of people, um, indigenous people in Northampton right now, um, and we need to welcome them as full members of our community. 
In many parts of the United States, US towns, cities, and organizations have stopped celebrating Columbus Day. And the Northampton schools can do this too. This is one way that the schools can provide a more welcoming and less hostile climate to indigenous people. So that Northampton should do what's morally right. Further, if you, just, if you could just I'll begin to wrap the sentence, up. Just yeah. the sentence. Um, Columbus did not foot, set foot in the United States current territory. And it's wonderful to recognize Italian Americans, but we should not do it through Columbus Day. Thank you. The next speaker is Mary Cowie. Good evening. My name is Mary Cowie. I live at 29 Laurel Park in Northampton, and I'm a math teacher at Jackson Street School. Um, speaking of math and numbers, you all know there's a funding crisis that's facing public schools in Massachusetts. Um, the Foundation funding formula has not been updated since 1993, and the impact on our public schools has been devastating. We've been feeling it here in Northampton, and if we look around at some of our urban neighbors in the Pioneer Valley, like Holyoke, Springfield, Chicopee, while Northampton has been underfunded about $800,000 a year, many of our neighbors have been underfunded many, many millions of dollars every year. This is a statewide issue. It's not just us. It's really about equity across the state and funding the public education we believe in. I know I'm preaching to the choir. So what I've come here tonight to talk with you about is some of the actions that are going to be happening this week in Northampton. We are really fortunate to have two public school parents representing us at the State House, Representative Lindsay Sabadosa and Senator Joe Comerford. They're both co-sponsors of the Promise Act, which will fund public education, pre-K to 12, and the Cherish Act to fund higher public ed. So on March 22nd, there is going to be a hearing at the Gardner Auditorium in Boston at 10 a.m and we really want to pack the place with people who are really ready to stand up for funding public education. Um, there's going to be a bus that's going from Northampton. It'll be leaving Sheldon Field at 7 a.m. Um, and leaving Boston to come back at 3 p.m. So we're trying to make it easy for people to go. I myself am gonna take a personal day so that I can be there. It's that much of a priority for me to see our schools be funded. So that's a sacrifice, a big sacrifice, but I'm asking all of you if you can also see your way clear to find some ways to put yourself out there for public education for the kids of our state. Um, we're also going to be doing standouts at every one of our public schools on Thursday, March 21st, in the half hour before school. So for the elementary schools, that would be 815 to 845, earlier for the elementary, for the high school and middle school. Um, but again, we would love for, especially if you can't make it to Boston, if you can make it to one of the standouts, um, it's a really important way to show our communities that we are all in this fight together. So I would like to just, um, oops, one moment. I just would like to pass around these are leaflets that just have information about those activities, a link and a phone number you can use to register for the bus. And this is just a clipboard. If you'd like to sign up and let us know if you can join us for the standouts or the Boston trip, just so we know who might be able to come. So I'll just pass this around. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you at the standouts, and hope to see you in Boston. I know Dr. Provost and I are going, and I hope many others will join us. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, there's no one else signed up, but is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay. Um, sorry. All right, no problem. <laughs> thought my, my timer was going to wire. Um, so are there any announcements from members of the school committee? Ms. Fallon. Um, since our student rep's not here, I just want to let everyone know that the girls' basketball team will be playing in the state finals um, at Holy Cross at 4.30 on Saturday. So if anyone can make it, I'm sure they would appreciate the support. 
Um, and we're also hosting um, a letter writing campaign on Monday night from 7 to 9 p.m. at Jackson Street School um, to write letters in support of the Promise Act. Okay. Other announcements? Okay. I do. Sure. I can't be specific, though, but I, um, since our student rep's not here, Greece is going to be at the high school on Thursday. Tonight, opening Friday, Friday. Which is why Ed's not here, I think. Saturday. <laughs> Two, two shows on seven. Saturday. Great. Two shows. Two and seven. All the other <laughs> ones are seven. And it's practically sold out, so <laughs> tickets. <That's good>. <clears throat> <laughs> Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, so now we have a series of recommended actions on the consent agenda. Uh, we have the approval of minutes of the February 14, 2019 school committee meeting. Um, and we have uh, budget transfers. Uh, one is the transfer for contracted services of 116000 and then the transfer of old to a newer account of $15,000. Is there a motion to approve? Or I'd like to move to, move to approve the consent agenda, but pulling the school committee meeting minutes um, for just a quick correction. Okay. So is there a second on the co consent agenda? Uh, did you have? Um, I could second it and then make my comment, or do I make it before the second? Is it about? I would like to pull something to ask a question on it. Okay. What, what would you like to pull? I would like to ask a question about the budget transfer related to old to new account. Sure. Um, Item C. So we will, so we'll pull A and C off of the agenda, um, which leaves lonely little B there. Um, so the consent agenda then is. Th there's been a motion made. Are, will you second it? Uh, yes. Okay. I so seconded by um, Ms. Voss, and um, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, and now we'll take up item A uh, of the minutes. Yeah, it's just a quick thing, but under announcements, um, it looks like I'm trying to replace myself. So could it just say, Ms. Fallon announced that an opportunity exists to have a voice as the MIAA sports, as an MIAA sports representative, not specifically basketball, because I was hoping to keep that. Okay. Thank you. So would you make a motion? To move to accept the meeting minutes from February 14th, 2019. With that correction. With that correction. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. And then um, you had a question about the $15,000 transfer. I did. Um, I think this is, I have a question and a comment. The minor thing is in the budget transfer request, it's 15500 so um, they're not consistent. And the question I have is it says, um, tech student help 15500 And my question is, is this just a transfer? Was that already budgeted for? Or is this additional um, money being spent on tech support? So this is originally budgeted in the fiscal 19 budget under the account number previously designated by the Department of Ed for that type of expenditure with the new Department of Ed codes, that's the new numbers need to be 4450, so we're just taking the same budgeted dollar amount and moving it to the new account number. Thank you. And is it, is, is it different from what's on the agenda? Is it 15? It's 15.5. Okay, so then we just have to make the motion Correct. be 15.5. Yes. So, yeah. so moved? So moved. Okay, so there's a motion second. made and seconded to basically change the account number on the same pot of appropriated money. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that is approved. Um, the next item on the agenda is reports and recommendations. We do not have um, a student representative here this evening, um, so we will actually move um, to recognize um, our uh, Director of Food Services, Mistel Hanna, who is going to be here to talk about um, two items, uh, a food service clerical reorganization, um, and then a vote on a grant. Um, so I would recognize uh, Ms. Hanna. Hello. So in regards to the first item, the food service um, clerical reorganization, I'm not sure if you're aware, but we have two individuals that work in the clerical positions um, for the food service department, each working about four hours per day. I recently received resignation for one of those positions. 
So I'm hoping to move to a one person six hour per day position for the food service office. Requires a vote or permission or how that works, but well, yeah, um, <laughs> okay. You might have to update the job description. Yeah, we may. Um, it may require the just a, re a change of the job description to incorporate, you know, whatever duties. But as I understand it, you're going to basically take. Um, it'll ultimately result in a savings, I would assume, for your department because of the two two additional hours, um, and then presumably an extra benefit package. Right. Um, depending on who, if that person took benefits. So, um, okay. Uh, is there any questions about that? Or I, I and just to interject, I believe it's the same job description for okay. both the positions because the positions okay. just split at this time. I'm not okay. sure why it was initially put that way. So there's just one job description for this. Okay. So, um, so will this then may not come back for a vote? May not come back for a vote then. Um, yes. Uh, will this result in any cost savings? Yes, it should result in cost savings, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, saving two hours a day of labor. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's package for one individual. Okay. So. All right. Um, well, thank you for that one. Then if you wanted to um, give us an update on this uh, grant for provision two breakfasts uh, for Bridge Street and Ryan Road. Yeah, I, the wording on the agenda is a little um, confusing. <clears throat> So what I am hoping to do with the approval from the school committee is to move to a free breakfast program for all students at Bridge Street Elementary School and as well as Ryan Road Elementary School. And that would be under the provision two guidelines, which is the USDA guidelines. I think you might have received a two page FRAC information on that. Uh, how that happens is that we would still collect free and reduced applications from all students as we do in all of our schools. Um, but next year, um, in moving to free breakfast, we would establish our base year. So for the following three years, we would be reimbursed from the government based on our base year for our breakfast only. Our lunch would be traditional as we are doing right now. Um, I had chose in hopes to do this with these two schools, do the high percentage of free and reduced students at that, those two schools. But overall, I think um, in the long term, it might be beneficial to move to all the elementary schools over several years to be able to provide free breakfast for our students. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions about that or discussions about that? Um, so it's actually a grant program that, or we would access, we'd be accessing funds, USDA funds. As we do now, yeah. right? Okay. We're just reimbursed differently um, okay. than we were before. So I also did apply for some grant funds from Project Bread and was awarded $4,000, $2,000 for each school to help um, with launching this if we did decide to go forward. And that would help with some administrative costs um, in trying to promote families to fill out free and reduce applications to get those numbers where they need to be. So. Okay. Mr. Coffin. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> sorry. I just had a quick question. Are you planning on actually serving it in the classroom or in the cafeteria for everyone? I have spoken to principals, both the principals, and they have different ideas. Um, overall, the goal is to serve breakfast after the bell, um, and that would have the best promotion and participation. And so each school has a different vision on how that would work. So. Okay. Mr. Kaufman. So I'm sorry, I think I got distracted, um, but did you say that um, this is at one school? Two. Bridge Street and Ryan Road. Okay, and so what's um, and what's the financial impact, if any, on this for us? Well, the financial impact wouldn't necessarily be an impact if the participation grew, and ideally, if you're offering it free to everybody, the participation would grow. Yeah. Um, so we would still be reimbursed, hoping that our participation of free and reduced qualified students would increase. So therefore, our um, reimbursement would increase. Yeah. So what's your goal here? I mean, I, I, I like a lot of what you're saying. I'm just not getting the big picture maybe or the big highlight of it. And it sounds exciting. I think the two pager kind of laid out some of the real advantages. Is What do you, what do you see as the big My goal for us? overall is just to feed as many students as possible and start yeah. their day the best way possible. And so I, I'm just trying to figure out the best way to do that here in Northampton schools. Um, and I, provision two, from the perspectives I've looked at and been shown, yeah. it seems like a good fit. And it's the big stigma issue, right, of getting rid of that or not? Yeah. I mean, breakfast is, it's difficult. It's a challenging meal to serve um, as you're dealing with buses coming in, parents dropping off at different times. There's the option of going outside versus coming into the cafeteria at yeah. some schools, which yeah. 
obviously we want our students to have that time outside as well. Right. Um, so you're taking all of that away and, you know, just providing it free, some in the classroom, some as they're walking in the door, handing them the breakfast, um, and then also whether they choose to in the cafeteria. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for thinking new and innovative and out of the box. I just, um, I don't know enough about it. I, I automatically trust you because you're thinking so in such a dynamic way. <laughs> no, but seriously, it sounds great. I read the two-pager. It, um, it, it's a slow start to what we can do, and I appreciate your thinking about where it can go if, it's, if it works out with the other additional elementary schools we have. So I do appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Foss. Um, thank you. Yes, I agree with my, what my colleagues have said, and I just have a question about um, in the funding for this is there any opportunities if, if breakfast is served after the bell to cover say an extra I don't know what the length of time is I'll just throw out 30 minutes in the day I don't know how long it takes to feed kids breakfast um, but we're gonna have a discussion later tonight about um, uh, school start times and one of the challenges there um, that I'm sure we're gonna talk more about is that the elementary day school is shorter than the other schools and if we started doing breakfast after the bell um, I could imagine that we wouldn't want to shorten other things and also if we could figure out a way to make it slightly longer and maybe breakfast is a piece of making it longer and affording how to do that um, it would fit nicely in some other um, areas so I don't know how you do breakfast after, I don't know if there's money to pay for people to help support that in terms of watching the children. So we, we're, it's not um, grant funded, so we're not given money up front. We're reimbursed just like we are now per person or individual that we feed. Um, so that doesn't really change. There wouldn't be money available per se for that. My experience with after the bell breakfast programs as opposed to before the bell, um, which takes about 30 minutes, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, after the bell, typically, they say it takes between five and seven minutes for a child to have breakfast in that time in the classroom, if that's where breakfast is ultimately um, consumed, is um, can be counted towards time on learning. Uh, teachers sometimes do activities, homework correction, socializing time, but still, it it's all in that same basket. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Ms. Hennessy. Just quickly, thank you. I love it. And uh, Ms. Fallon, Ms. Buzanski, Dr. Provost, and I went to a conference last year at Clark, and one of the presenters was on the um, breakfast after the bell and just the unbelievable positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think this is a great step, and um, it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, so um, it's not like, a, it's, I guess it's not a grant. So there's a, you're asking for a vote? We need a vote or? Permission to do so. <laughs> okay. Permission granted. Uh, so, um, so would you like to fashion a motion that the school committee endorses the provision to? I move for the school committee to endorse breakfast after the bell at Bridge Street School and Ryan Road School. Second. Presented. Second. Okay. Um, okay, any further discussion on this? Um, okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? So, um, unanimous on both. Well, thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much again. Okay, uh, the next item on the agenda is a uh, conference request. This is um, for at Northampton High School. It's called the Pencils Down Conference, uh, March 26th through the 27th, uh, 2019 in Baltimore, Maryland. And I believe uh, Ms. Podell is here to um, talk about the conference and answer any questions that we have about it. So maybe you wanna just give us a quick introduction to what it's all about. Yeah. Hi, I'm Jenny. Or just put out, I guess. Um, <laughs> so I was invited along with a student to attend a conference for all college board employees that will show the representation of what an AP curriculum is supposed to give their students. And the college board will pay for myself to go and it's a volunteer um, position for me and will fully fund a student to come with me so that, that student can partake in a little committee that's going to happen on the first day where college board employees can ask like the impact of AP testing and, and how that influenced kind of my students' choices and what she's taken at school and just get some 
the kids' opinions on their AP program and how it's benefited or maybe not benefited them. Um, and then we get to give a sample lecture. I say we because this way my student can give some examples of what my kids would really say in an AP class. So we're asked to present to about 150 to 200 College Board employees and showing a representation of what class would be like. So that people who work for College Board all around the world uh, understand what they are supporting. The curriculum that they hope to be endorsing and promoting is basically set by the lesson that I will give with the help of my student. So that's the, the plan. Um, and the conference runs all day on Tuesday and Wednesday, but we're just going to be there for the Tuesday dinner portion and panel after dinner. And then we will be there on Wednesday morning to do our lecture, and then we will leave on Wednesday to come back here. Has this student been selected already? Yes, yeah, so I selected my uh, teacher's assistant who also took AP 1 physics uh, with me last year and is in my AP physics C, mechanics and electricity and magnetism, which you know about because one of your daughters took that one. Yes. <laughs> yes, so I picked my TA because if I can only pick one student, I really adore all of my students and I wish I could take them all, but funding says I could take one. So I chose my TA because this way I wasn't singling anybody out. Mm -hmm. okay. Excellent. Uh, any questions about that? Okay. So could I get a motion to approve the field trip request? So moved. Okay. Is there second. A second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Thank Have you. fun in Baltimore. <laughs> very excited. <laughs> very much. Have some crabs for me. I love, <laughs> love, love Baltimore. Um, <laughs> Used to live Balmore. Balmer. Yeah. Balmer. Balmer. <laughs> it's called Balmer. Um, say it right. I'm okay. Say it right. So the next <laughs> item on the agenda is a job description. Uh, this is an item Dr. Provost will present, and it's for the new um, equity position in the district. Thank you. This is just moving our thinking and our conversation a little bit further than it was at the time of the first view budget. This job description actually was prepared but I wasn't didn't want to be so presumptuous as to share it at that meeting um, one of the the questions that came up in that discussion and then has come up in with some of my some of my conversations with the members of the school committee since then are really to sort of clarify the goals um, and I think of this position is having two goals. The ultimate goal is to improve equity of outcomes for students within the district. Um, you know, you've heard me present a number of times about equity gaps we have in the district and really closing those gaps is really being the only strategy we have um, to improve overall outcomes for students because some of the students in our um, who wouldn't be considered diverse are already basically pegging <coughs> out every kind of measure we have. Um, so that's the ultimate goal. The proximate goal would be to help us recruit a more diverse teacher workforce. So I think that is the thing that you'd be able to see most quickly and then further on down the road um, I would hope that we'd be able to have less of a gap between the positive outcomes that we're able to um, produce for students who are members of majority groups and students who are members of minority groups. So in this, I just call your attention to item number one in the essential <laughs> functions, which is um, the one that has to do with employee recruitment. I also would draw your attention to number five because when I presented it, I talked about analytics because I thought that one of the things that this person would be doing quite a bit is helping us to analyze our data, helping us to um, maybe better see some of our blind spots in ways that some groups of students are succeeding better than others. Um, of course, all the job description is important, but, but those two things that I would just draw to your attention. And the other thing I would say is this is only a vote on the job description. This isn't a vote on the funding that goes with it, um, but it's to give you more information so that you can um, have a better understanding of what you'd be voting for or voting against at the next meeting. Okay. So there's not a, you're not actually asking for a vote to approve the job description? I am for a vote to approve the job description, but not for funding for the job description at this, for the okay. job at this point. Okay. Um, okay. So I see two hands. Is it a, is it a parliamentary question or? No, I just had a question about the, 
you make a motion just to put it on the floor? Uh, yeah, sure. I move to approve the job description for the equity position. Okay. Well, second for now? Second. Okay. So question and question. Um, so my question was just um, that you, Dr. Provost, just said how the ultimate goal was to um, ensure equity of outcomes. But that's not in the job description, really. Like that's not literally in there. It's alluded to. We talk about other things, and it seems like if that's our ultimate goal, that maybe that should be embedded in there. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where you'd want to put it, or if I'd have to make a motion now. But you can make a motion to amend it to add that, or right. But I'm just you know, saying I don't know where the best place to. So I would think that it would be in the definition, or. Um, and I'll just share another member asked whether this position being as unique as it would be within our district deserves a rationale. Um, I just got that question, I think it was yesterday or today, so I haven't had a chance to check with HR on that. Um, that's not something that I've seen in any other positions. But if HR is okay with the concept of putting a rationale in the position, that might be a good place to, to embed that kind of goal. Uh, so you described in our first view of the budget a half-time position, but this says full-time? Right. So the job description is written for our goal of getting it up to full-time. At this point, we only have funding for half-time. Um, so obviously the expectations of someone who we're able to bring on for in a half-time capacity wouldn't be as high as they would be for someone who would be able to bring on in a full-time capacity. But in similar way to many other positions we have, where there are both full-time employees and part-time employees. We don't change the job description for the part-time employees. We just expect less because they have less time to devote to the position. Got it. So we'll put it out there as a, we'll, we're writing a full-time job description, <coughs> but we'll put it out there as a half-time. At this point, that's right. It's all we've been able to find. But in the event that we're able to find more funds to increase it, then you know, we would be able to increase the hours the job description would still apply. We would just say, okay, we need you to do more of this now. Yes, Mr. Kaufman. Thank you. Um, so last time we spoke about this, I had mentioned a concern. I shared a concern. Um, I no longer have that concern. What I did is I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people. I spoke to, I think, about 10 people, students, uh, alumni, people in my community. And I, I, um, I was concerned, and I still am a little bit concerned about you know, identifying an individual for a position and thus that becoming that person's job. And I've seen that happen. So I'm concerned about it, but not a, not not as concerned anymore, certainly not to not be excited about the position which I am now. And that's because people convinced me that f people that have done this work have really seen that you need a designated person. It's too squishy otherwise. It just becomes easy, too easily forgotten in other people's job descriptions. So I appreciate the effort here a great deal. Um, so with that said, um, I really want to attract the best person possible, so I have some um, comments and questions regarding the job description that I, would, I certainly want to throw out there for your consideration. Um, first, I do think it was a great idea eliminating that analytics piece from the job title. It's still there and it's still a key component, thank you, but it was, it was getting confusing. Um, I do think that by making it necessary that the person has one of those certifications that we're eliminating potentially a lot of strong candidates, is there any way around that, um, that they're Massachusetts certified for those different administrative posts? Is this position potentially unique enough that we could um, work around that? So the, the way that that's frequently worked around is to add a, another bullet point in the qualifications saying other qualifications that the superintendent deems are appropriate. Yeah. Have you thought about that? And, and is that something that you... I have. I actually think that would be a good addition. Okay. Well, if you want to ask other people, I do think it would be. And, and in particular, um, if there's someone from another state, then right off the bat, they might not understand what it takes to become Massachusetts certified. But I, I am, I do think that this is a unique job with a special skill set, and I think we want to make it as broad as possible to attract good candidates. Mm -hmm. um, the other idea, and you know, I, Dr. Prevost mentioned it. It was, it was. It, I, I strongly believe that we would be in a much better place if we introduced within the job description some sort of background or rationale. And the people we do it for is actually, I think, for your position. We, we have done that for superintendent positions before and put something out there that um, just makes it really attractive. So if we can do that and you can fight for it if someone says no or the mayor can support it, I, what I have in mind is something that, again, that we talk about 
this community and the unique special qualities of Northampton that we make it enticing and I think we need to really begin by citing some of the amazing things we already do in the schools uh, and I thought about what we've done so I know we did PD last year for the year before with Barbara Love mm -hmm. I know of our staff were trained we have amazing NEF grants that really seem to extend the um, the types of learning and activities that we do into a more inclusive environments speaking of inclusion we went towards full inclusion uh, we have multicultural events each year and, and I know I'm just scratching the surface so I think that would be exciting for some Somebody to see that they're walking into a district that has already embraced this um, and you know and I think a strong statement that we're really committed to growing this work and getting there and you and I just took a glance Dr. Provost of how you wrote this middle paragraph in your budget and you know something like that that really speaks to your heart and our heart are like enough is enough you know, we, we need to close the achievement gap. It's been going on too long. This is not the result of educators. This is the result of societal sort of pressures that kids are facing with. And we as a district are making a commitment to moving there. And that's the kind of bold sort of boldness, I think, that will be attractive to folks. And I'm really excited by the prospects of seeing who would, who would do this. Um, so I congratulate you for moving ahead with it. And I just, I guess I'm just encouraging you to think the ways that we could attract candidates that are gonna make a really uh, positive difference and, and uh, correspond to the goals that you had to share with us. I would only just add that, you know, there's the job description, which is sort of the technical, you know, yeah, and then there's actually the job posting. Yeah. Those yeah. can be much different. Okay, so, thank you. you know, what goes yeah. up on, school on schools, whatever is it called? School spring. spring. School spring, sorry. Well, I, okay, I would add, I would, I, would, I would endorse the idea of much more widespread posting. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. More than just school spring, which is kind of a novelty I think a lot of Massachusetts people know about and maybe not others, but you're right. If there's another way to advertise uh, and this sort of, if Dr. Provost can develop some sort of intro that makes it enticing, that would be, I think, more than welcome and good idea. Um, so I'll follow up on that and, and thank you. Um, I think this is a super important position and it's brand new and so I don't I'm not trying to be negative but I think we need to work on this um, job description because it can be even better and so what we're doing here is so important that it's to me worth it to take a step back and say how can we make this much more clear and I'll I, I guess I, I want to start by saying I don't know who participated in writing it but um, and then I, I just have some spe a few specific suggestions and ways to go. In some ways, it, I think it needs to be shorter. And, and I agree with Ms. Fallon when, you, when I read it, it's not really clear what the person's doing. And I, I think we've um, made some suggestions here, and I have a few others. But did, did the group real um, racial equity? Uh, um, um, yeah, sorry. I, I, our group real racial equity and learning within Northampton have they had a chance to weigh in on this or any other sorts of groups um, that um, have pe members of them that think about this the anti-bias committee created the first draft of this okay um, and then it went to the central office team the modifications made by the central office team were really minor okay um, basically the the main thing we changed was to make the the bargaining union non-rep um, for the reasons that we discussed at, at the last meeting. Okay. Um, also put in some of the language about titles and things that you know um, teachers might not be aware of. So but the, the essence of it came from them and then it went to HR. So I would say you know down to qualifications that yeah. really was the work of the of the uh, anti-bias committee and the central office team, and then the preferred competencies are more or less boilerplate language that HR okay. put on. So, so, I mean, I think what it says is the, exactly the right kind of stuff. I just worry that it's not as clear as it could be. And one example is somewhere in the beginning, you know, when I think about what this person's going to do, I, I, if I have to do it in a sentence, I, what I wrote was something like, oversee development and administration of equity and diversity related initiatives and the assessment of them. Like big picture, it's really not about um, just hiring a more diverse staff. Yes, that's a piece of it, but a bigger picture is systematic, systemically through our school system working to 
make this a much more inclusive environment for years to come. And so like that's one specific example. But if we can make it more broad, I think it attracts a bigger thinking kind of person. And um, another example you, you actually highlighted under essential functions. Um, some of these are just big picture and some are so nitpicky. I think it would be hard for a person applying for this job to know which one to focus on. But five, collect and analyze data to support and enhance equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives and to provide risk assessments regarding discrimination, inequity, and district culture and climate. But then, so that's an essential function, but there's nothing under the qualifications that relates to that essential function. And so that's just another example where I think with a little time, and I'm happy, or other people, maybe people in real, others getting more input on this, just to brainstorm how we can make it tighter. Um, under qualifications, it says, demonstrated knowledge of issues of social justice. Um, I'd, go, I, I'd rather word it something like, experience and success in equity, diversity, and inclusion leadership. So not just they know it, but they actually have demonstrated real success in these things. So those are just a couple of suggestions. I just think that kind of um, like fine tooth comb on this before we send it out and approve it could make it that much better. And I'm really excited about it. I think you know, the intent of it is amazing and that's why I marked it up because I want it to be really good. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, so given that there's I don't know how we want to proceed. Given that there's the funding's not there, that's a further down the road. Do we want to postpone this vote and have you send some comments, so, or how, how would you like to proceed? So what I actually think I'd like to do, since this meeting is videotaped, is meet with again with the anti-bias committee, play the tape for them, let them take in the committee members' comments, and okay. see what kind of revisions we can come up with. That's great. Okay, Miss Hennessy. Uh, my, my one concern <coughs> is regardless of how it comes out, is what Ms. Buzanski said at the beginning, that it's it's a full-time posting, a full-time job, and I worry about how it, the reality of a half-time, um, and how that's going to be prioritized and supported. I worry about a, a person being taken advantage of because they're going to be working, I mean, they're so interconnected that it does seem like a full-time job, and we've talked about this at the last meeting. So that's, as you're writing that, that's just my major concern that I don't, it feels like more than a full-time job. It feels like a department. And so then to know, knowing that it's gonna be a half-time position, um, I actually really, I, I was reading it, and that's all I thought of the whole time. So that's my, my comment. I have one more comment. When I read it, I actually thought it had changed from a half-time to a full-time position since our last meeting. And I would just second that, that I have similar concerns of how somebody can do this in a, a half-time position. Ms. Fallon. So I'm wondering, since you made a motion and seconded it, do we vote it down or do we make a new um, motion? I would just say that if the makers of the motion wanted to withdraw their motion, um, so I can withdraw my motion. Sure, fine, and then we'll just we'll bring it to the next. You know, I don't think we have to. Okay. There's nothing imminent about it, so there's no funding for it. It wouldn't happen until July one, mm -hmm. so we have plenty of time to okay. go back and withdraw the board a little bit. So. Okay. Okay. So um, the next item on the agenda is a couple. Uh, a gi a, first, a gift. Um, this is a gift from the NHS PTO of eleven $1 hundred dollars for theater equipment. Um, uh, would someone make a motion to approve that? I'll made make a motion, motion to approve the, um, the gift from NHS PTO to friends. Oh, excuse me, which is friends of the Northampton Theater for one thousand one hundred dollars to purchase equipment for the Black Box Theater. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Um, Ms. Lamica, did you have anything to add? No. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, mm -hmm. Next, we have a vote on a grant from the JFK PTO. Um, would someone make a motion to put that on the table? Ms. Burnham? Sure, I'll make a motion to put on the table the PTO grant for $2,820. Okay. Uh, for the Boston Globe Scholastic Writing Group. Second. Second. Okay. Ms.
Ms. Lambert, do you have anything to add? The only thing I wanted to bring to the committee's attention was um, on the donation form itself. It said the deposit to the account would be to the student activity fund. That will not be the case. It will be going to the um, gift account in the um, city's records. Okay. Did you have a question, Ms. Fallon? No, it's not a question. I would just like to say that I think this program is so valuable um, and that I would love it if we could figure out a way to fund it other than through the JFK PTO. Um, it was funded for three years prior to this by um, the Northampton Education Foundation and the PTO picked it up this year and I know that they can't afford to cover the cost of this program indefinitely. Mm -hmm. But I'm grateful they did this year. Okay. Yeah. So duly noted. Um, all those in favor of accepting the gift from uh, JFK PTO, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Any abstentions? Okay. Um, next, we have a vote uh, to authorize uh, the superintendent uh, to negotiate with NACE for bus driver training. Dr. Provost. I realize that we are currently in contract negotiations, but I would uh, request authority to do this outside of the contract because this is an issue that, as you know, is very pressing for us. We've had inability to find bus drivers since the beginning of the year. Um, we actually had to transfer funds back from personnel line items to, to contracted services because we don't have enough drivers for our buses. Um, we've tried a number of different recruitment uh, mechanisms and at this point we're feeling our best option is to train our own drivers um, so we do have some individuals who we think have the skills but just aren't currently licensed however as I've also shared with you Van Pool, <coughs> Durham and all the rest of the contractors who we work with are also short staffed for bus drivers so I'm not interested in training staff to go work for one of our other vendors. Um, so one of the things that I talked with NACE about sort of in a hypothetical way is if we could have an agreement that created a disincentive for employees who we trained uh, and, and were able to obtain licenses for to leave the district. Um, so we talked about basically withholding a portion of the salary that was equal to the amount that the district spent on training for the individual over a period of time and then refunding that if the individual was still with the district at the end of that, that work-in period. Um, so that's basically the concept. NACE is open to the concept, um, and I'd just like to try to explore that a little more. Okay. Any um, comments, or someone make a motion for that, and we can just debate it? Move to authorize the superintendent to negotiate with NACE for bus driver training. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay. And then Ms. Hennessy. So I feel like I'm super negative right now, but I really have a problem with with that. Um, I absolutely understand it from an economic perspective it makes so much sense and I've been thinking about this a lot um, my problem is that I feel like we keep punishing the lowest paid people and we train I'm trained my district pays me for PD and no one says we're gonna withhold your salary if you leave to go to a better paying district um, and people do <laughs> um, and so I feel like I j it just sits with me wrong I don't feel good about it, and I and I don't like when we we hit the lowest paying paid people, and so that's my opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I? Yes, Ms. Lamaker. If I can just follow up for a minute, um, one of the things that with the candidates that we've looking at, we've actually um, have met with folks from Mass Hire, mm -hmm. and as of July, they will have funds to train people in the future. Um, so right now, they do not. So we've found a few candidates right now that have CDL licenses, but they don't have school bus endorsement licenses. Um, so that's what the issue is. And it costs a certain dollar amount to get that license. Um, and we're looking for some commitment from those folks to stay with us if we pay for that training and provide them yeah. no, the education piece that they're willing to stick it out with us. And we'll, we were looking at potentially taking the money in the beginning, but then they would get that back. So it would be no cost to them, and they would get it up front, and it works out for everyone. Ms. Voss. Um, can you share with us roughly how much money we're talking about in terms of the number of drivers and how much it, this training costs? Uh, the training that we've talked to the vendors about $2,400 each 
person um, and we're trying to work with the vendor about you know after so many days we'd evaluate whether that person is going to make it through the program um, whether we would be paying that full amount or not um, and that's what we're looking at doing yes uh, I want to just offer something from my own experience which might make it a little bit more palatable to you um, so I went through two higher ed programs through federally mm -hmm. sponsored programs, all of which had a penalty if I didn't work in public education for mm -hmm. a certain number of years. So it's kind of that same concept. Yeah. It's not something that's only for um, bus drivers. Yeah. And I would add that we, on the city side, we have some, um, some training opportunities for mid and upper level management where they do, you know, through Suffolk University. Yeah. Um, and we have a process whereby we they sign an agreement that if they mm -hmm. leave in less than three years that they'd have to pay back yep. you know, the city's no, portion of it. Yep. So, okay. so it's not something that's just, but yeah. yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a common model. So, so. Um, so there was a motion made and seconded. Any further, and again, this is just to authorize the, the discussion um, about a possible MOU. Um, and then you'd bring that back to us for us to review and approve. That's right. Okay. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So, um, the next item on the agenda um, is a discussion. This is actually turned to our colleague, uh, Ms. Hennessy, who, who asked to have this on the agenda. Um, this is a discussion about changing the start time of the elementary, middle, middle and high schools to all begin 30 minutes later. So I'm sure, you know, because of open meeting laws, we don't talk about this, but I know that, you know, the last time we voted on this was a, a while ago, and a lot of people in different meetings have presented um, offer their opinion on how they support a late start and it just never comes up and I feel like sometimes we we know the research that school shouldn't start for high school students and middle school students um, any earlier than 830 so like we know the research it's super clear um, it, it you can't argue with it so it's been about the process and how we do it um, and so I feel like we've been letting the perfect get in the way of the good and that if we can, and Dr. Provost had spent a lot of time on this, we could, without cost, bump everything up 30 minutes. It's not perfect, but it's later. Um, and that possibly that would begin a process of us, w we'd have movement, I guess. Um, and that's what I, I think we need as a community, the communities behind this. With that said, I think we need a process where the community, um, who it's really going to affect gets to talk a little bit about it. And that's the elementary school parents and middle school parents. And because while it's clear, we know Boston started to put it forth and they had to pull it back because of some of this, the weeds. Um, and a lot of other communities, if you look on, uh, des I don't know, if you look on a website of all these Massachusetts schools moving toward it, it's the process that gets stuck. And to me, if there's no cost, um, it's one way of getting us moving in this direction. Again, it's not perfect, it's not 8.30, um, but it's, it's getting us moving as a community. And I think we've all supported this in the past, and I just think our community, well, and I, so I wanna see more of this, um, uh, us moving. So that's why I wanted to open up a discussion. Dr. Provost had done a lot of due diligence in figuring out how we could um, move it up at least 30 minutes. I would note that the school committee moved its time 30 minutes yeah. back, and we all survive, but yeah. that's a different story. <laughs> um, so uh, anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I really want to thank Anne for bringing this up and getting another way of thinking about this. Um, and I really agree with her um, about getting the elementary schools involved in this conversation and one of the things that I've always um, noticed about this conversation is that there's a plethora of data about high school students and many times the conversation goes well just move the elementary schools to earlier and um, just this feeling like well actually there's not a plethora of data about what's perfect for elementary schools and for those students and it's fine you know on a very personal anecdote which I actually don't usually like to draw from I have two kids one is an early riser one isn't 
my kid who got up early did not want to go to school early. And cognitively, younger kids do not have the executive function to push themselves out of the school, out to school, whereas I do think high schoolers do have that executive function. And so um, I really, really, really like the idea of going for something that's closer. Um, and I really like the idea of getting the elementary parents talking about this because it would move them to later, which it's already pretty late. <laughs> yes, Dr. Provost. Since you have the floor, I just want to remind you of something you shared with me earlier today that I thought was a really good idea. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> in terms of getting feedback from the elementary schools, you had suggested having the school councils weigh in on this, um, which I think makes yeah. perfect sense. They're the perfect place. I mean, I'll echo what I heard and just say thank you for bringing it up. Um, it must have been over a year ago that I told people that um, Dr. Provost and I had met with some professors at UMass, and I just want to report I, I have actually found out that they're working on it and they don't have anything to present yet, but they're, there's a graduate student thinking about our busing, and, you know, I, I actually think that that kind of study takes some time and some community conversation and that we should not hold this up for that but I hope to be able to report back in a few months anything they maybe have thought about in terms of our busing and making it less expensive but I'm really glad to see this on the agenda um, many years before I was on the school committee I shared concerns about flipping the elementary school at the high school and I think that this model that Ms. Hennessy has proposed is in a lot of ways a really smart way to go because it's a step in the right direction but it's not as big of a um, thing where you'd have maybe some really unintended consequences associated with it and to just add to the discussion um, as this moves ahead I think we also need to hear from the teachers um, as a you know a teachers have children in daycare for example and it's this time of year they need to be thinking about what their needs are for their families next year and so the, there's a lot of thoughtful things that need to happen and that isn't a reason to say not to do it but um, it is one of those things where if we if we um, nudge it like you're proposing um, I think that's a really good thing yeah uh, Ms. Fallon and then Ms. Burnham um, I just wanted to bring up because um, Dr. Vasa just mentioned about flipping the start times for the elementary and the high school. <laughs> that was um, last year at the MASC Summer Institute. There was um, a session on school districts that had changed the start time, and that was one thing. I think it's Monomoy, the regional district, um, had flipped the times and they said that they had been so focused on the high school but there had been all these benefits to the elementary school to starting earlier that they had um, fewer nurses visits fewer disciplinary problems children weren't as sleepy at three o'clock in the afternoon so I would I wouldn't like to I don't want to discount the possibility that there are benefits to the elementary school students to starting earlier because I do worry that 920 is going to be tough for working parents to try and get their kids to school. Um, so I'm all for figuring out a way to make a later time work, but I um, I don't, I would like to see if there's more research on elementary schools, even if it's just putting out um, a request on one of the superintendent listservs to ask um, you know, what the results have been, because I know that that was something that we all asked them to do, was really track their data in a definitive um, way over the next couple years while they were looking at this. Burnham. Yeah. And just to, um, to add to this, I think that um, especially since Susan has just reported on that the UMass study is going ahead, this might be a time and, and Downey sort of has, there's a few people that are the historical record here that remember that there was a time when people, parents seemed to be resistant to um, elementary kids and older kids riding on the bus and it might be a time for us to explore that, you know, and again bringing in all of you know the whole community the school councils could reach out to the elementary school parents and see if there's changes and I think that again you know teachers always play a part in this because they have great you know they're always with the students and they meet with the parents so I you know not only as like how, how their lives work as teachers in our community and also as facilitators of change <laughs> whatever we we do it is always with them 
So I would like that, you know, that that could be put out as a question for them too. Do you have a Dr. Provost and Chair Claus? I just have a, a comment about process. Uh, you know, in my office, I've got a shelf full of late start plans yeah. created by me and my predecessors, um, all of which have been voted down. I think that having too many options at once could cause us to have the same result that happened in the past. I think it should be one idea at a time, yes or no, and then that's just my feeling. I, I can't predict that for sure, but I think it would be simpler to only put one option in front of people. Um, so, so the option that Ms. Hennessy has started the conversation with, I'm not sure if people watching are aware of exactly what was proposed, um, which is to start each school half an hour later and then to end each school half an hour later, correct? Mm -hmm. And I just, I think that's one option, but um, I, I don't mind brainstorming a little and just offering one other, which take it or leave it. Um, the real, one of the issues is starting the elementary school at 920 is on the late side for a lot of families. And when you start looking at the way our buses work, the really big constraint seems to me to be our elementary day school is a half hour shorter, roughly. There's five minutes off, but I'm just going to talk in terms of 30 minutes because it's easier to think about. So if the high school starts at 730, what time does JFK start? Just before 8? Yeah, seven, seven, five. Can I do, I'm just going to say eight because it's easy yeah, for me to nine. think in terms of half hour. And then the elementary school, I'm going to just say nine. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so if you <laughs> shift all those by half an hour, what you notice is there's a whole hour between when JFK and the elementary school start. At the end of the day, we end at 2, 2.30, and 3. Okay. And so there's only a half hour between each of the schools at the end of the day. And that's because the elementary school day is roughly a half hour shorter than the other two school days. And so if you, you need to make up for that either in the morning or in the afternoon with the busing, which is how we get to the elementary school day starting so late. But if you want to shift everybody a little later, my suspicion is, and I don't know for sure, that you could start the bus, the schools at 8, 8.30, and 9, okay? And then you have a problem at the end of the day. And I see two different ways you could go about solving that, if that's what you did. Um, one, you could figure out a way to extend that elementary day somewhat, and that might not mean more hours for the teachers. I don't, maybe it means more recess or more after school activity. That's a conversation. But you could extend the elementary school day in some way. Or you could say, this is benefiting the middle school and the high school kids based on what we've all been talking about, so maybe they give a little. And another thing would be to say maybe there's not a bus at the high school at 2 o'clock. Maybe there's a later bus because the high school has so much wonderful stuff happening after school and it's good for the kids to be there um, that we rearrange the way we bus home from the high school and that could potentially solve it and not have the elementary school day start that late. Okay. So, Ms. Pusansky. I just want to thank you, Ms. Hennessy, for bringing this up, because I think we really are overdue to restart this conversation, and I think it's something that we all have, you know, or we've heard a lot about, and I think a lot of us believe, I know for one, I really do believe in figuring out, figuring out a way to crack this nut, and I think we have to move away from the perfect. I think, Dr. Voss, you bring up a couple really good ideas about how we might be able to approach it. I think we're gonna, we are going to bump up again, against parent, working parents who have a hard time getting, you know, having the elementary day start at 920. So if we're going to charge the school council with looking into this, I just would really like to encourage them to really try and hear from their community and not just have a decision that's made or discussed at the school council level. I think, and I believe the PTO <laughs> is another great resource. They access their parents in all sorts of ways to really hear from our community. Otherwise, I think this could really um, backfire, and I know we're trying to come up with a you know cost-neutral way to do this, but I think that maybe there is some way to think about what do we do with what could those kids be doing from nine to nine twenty, or you know three to three thirty, if not you know uh, you know some way that might cost something, but not as much as you know that hundred thousand dollar, ninety thousand dollar price tag we kept seeing, whatever it was, eight, six, eight, ten years ago you know, but some smaller amount, because I think that's, you know, 
we've all sort of identified that's kind of the catch in all this. So, oh, oh, just Mr. Meyer. Um, I hope that we can move the start time later. Um, but before we spend a lot of time talking about it, I hope that the committee understands that we will make some people in our community very unhappy if we make an adjustment. And that might just be part of our job, that if we think that it's better for enough of our students educationally and health-wise, that we make that decision. Um, we, we don't allow you know, kids under a certain age to work. Um, because we don't think it's a good thing for them, right? As a society, we have laws against that. We require kids under certain age to get work permits. Again, their families could use the money, but we say, no, we're gonna limit your hours. So we do a lot of things that, you know, through regulation or through policy, make members of the community unhappy. And I, I think that we spent four, my first four years on the school committee, spending a lot of time on this. Um, it's like, when Sue's talking, it's like listening to Howard when he would, you know, <laughs> before he was on the school committee, would spitball from, you know, in public comment about how we could change things. Um, and I, I think we invested a lot of time and resources in coming up with solutions. But at the end of the day, you're going to have parents. And I still remember, you know, Tom Dumphy meeting me after the meeting and saying how I was going to take away his time with his kid after school. Um, and they're going to be passionate. And if you don't have the stomach, to make that change, then it probably isn't worth about investing a lot of time in. So how do we advance this discussion? Like what, what's the, where do we go from here? Mr. Zahowski. I'm not sure exactly where we go from here, um, but what I would say is that the discussion tonight has started around this idea of adding 30 minutes onto the start time and end time of our schools. And I think um, perhaps where it starts is do the school councils giving some information from folks hearing about this through the meeting this evening um, and then sharing their thoughts with us and see what the appetite of the school district is for making this change. But I will echo Mr. Meyer's comments. One of the reasons that this change hasn't happened is because there isn't a perfect solution. In order to get those minutes for the most needed students that sleep, which we know through studies is to move the high school start time to a later time. And we come up against affecting other groups as well. And I think the one that will be most impacted here, it certainly will be the elementary schools as I've heard um, many of you speak of tonight. And I too have had many conversations with um, parents of young students who have shared with me the struggles that it is at times to get their school, their students to school for 8.50. And um, the threshold has always been nine o'clock and we've gone over that by 20 minutes by offering this proposal. So I certainly expect that I'm going to hear from many elementary school parents who say that this is going to be challenging. But that's what it is, it's challenging. It's not impossible. It will affect people, their work, um, their family life. But I think again, as Mr. Meyer said, if it is the uh, recommendation and then the vote of the school committee that in order to achieve the goal of having high school students go to school at a later time, this is one of those times where we're going to have to make a tough decision. And so I thank Ms. Hennessy for bringing this forward. I think it's a proposal that is, you know, doesn't affect the, the cost of anything um, to the district financially, but it will cost families time, maybe um, needing childcare transportation, we don't know how it will affect those other families, but I think we owe it to the community to let them weigh in, share their thoughts with us, and then we can come back to the table and have a discussion about whether or not this is the direction we want to go. But I think, as Dr. Provo said, it's very important to keep very specific ideas on the table at once so that we can either accept them or decline them and move on to another type of idea that might achieve what we're after. I was curious, what's the process for getting, is this, the, the, do the principals set, help set the agenda for school councils, correct? Yes. So there would be a, there could be a communication that we wanted all the school councils to put this on their agenda and have yep. a discussion and, yeah. okay. You know, and I've been doing research on this and everyone else does research a long time ago. Seattle though, who recently did this, they did a three-year community um, public 
it was just a campaign, and let's figure this out. And it was multi-million dollar. I mean, this was like a sixteen million dollar cost. So this is a very different district. But my point is, I do think if even if we set a date, like, hey, we have until we, this is what we're doing. We want to do this. I don't care what it is. This is one proposal, but we want to do this for the 2021-22 school year. We want the communities to win because frankly so many people who are incredibly impassioned about this their kids are out of college now um, and so a lot of people haven't been in this discussion particularly elementary school students uh, or families and so I'm I'm open to anything I just think we need to move and I do think I really think that the community families teachers administrators really need to be a part of this and I know it's been done before but for me I think we need to do it and setting a time frame is is it makes perfect sense, as Mr. Don and Mr. Zuhowski said. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so there's not really a vote necessarily tonight. It was just a discussion. But the idea then would be to try to advance this to the school councils to get the conversation. We need to, do we need to instruct our superintendent to do that, or do is that good enough? I think it's good enough. <laughs> okay. I did have one comment. Sure. You know, I, I think one of the things about the you know, the discussions before and, and since. It's really interesting. I don't know, it's some sort of psychology thing that, that, you know, whatever the status quo is, is seen as being completely ex sort of acceptable and normal. And I think when you think about these changes and you recognize, at, at least in our family, we had to make enormous adjustments when we went from having no children to having children, to having children in preschool, you know, in terms of when we, you know, because we had jobs, we had, you know, and then enormous adjustments from preschool to elementary school, and then from elementary school to middle school, and middle school to high school, and still. So, <laughs> so each one of those adjustments we made without saying, how come they, well, we did actually say, how come they set it up this way? <laughs> but we didn't, yeah. but, we, but we recognized that it had to be set up somewhere. <laughs> And that this happened to be the way it was, and we made enormous shifts around. Already, you know, people do amazing things because of the elementary school start time, right? Every single one of the elementary schools has some sort of an affiliated program where people can drop their kids off at seven o'clock or six thirty or something in the morning because, well, they need somebody to watch their children until the school start already. Um, and we don't talk about that now with the present thing. We act as though. Before school is no problem for everybody. You go, well, no, there's, there's a, a large number of kids at every single elementary school who parents are having to make a big, a big sort of whole research project and figuring out the drop-offs and doing all these things. And the same thing after school. We act as though, you know, everybody's got after school wired. And the answer is yes, they do, because you know nobody drops off the face of the earth. But it's not like it was just easy or is easy for everybody there's plenty of scrambling around on a regular basis to make sure you have coverage for your kids and you know depending on what you do for a living that's either changes day to day or you figure out some kind of a routine that lasts until the other components of that routine say move away <laughs> or 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 um you know whatever whatever however that routine got figured out and um and so it's, so, it's, so it's not like the status quo is just like perfectly calm water and nobody had to do a lot of work. And I think then when you talk about making changes, it's so many of the arguments against any change, no matter what the change is, are actually would be valid arguments against the status quo as well. You know, in terms of, well, that's just not going to work. For, it's, that's right, it's not. It, you know, I mean, the classic one is, the classic one that I think I see is, is the one I'm saying, well, you know, older kids take care of younger kids. Correct. But... Those older kids were once younger kids, and unless these people are on some kind of a production schedule that I'm not familiar with, they didn't have an older kid at the time, right? So at least one of those kids didn't have an older kid, and those, that family figured out how to care for that kid without having a high school student available, right? And they figured out how to do it with only having a, maybe a second grader available. So they had a kindergartner and a second grader, and they figured out how to do it without having the second grader take care of the kindergartner. Right? And it's not like that was easy or like, or like it was, you know, we, and there's, but there's be nothing that we, in terms of our schedule or our transportation system, could have done to make that easy. It, it was hard and it's a hard thing, you know? 
and, and but it's not it's not we aren't responsible for it. And I guess I mean we're responsible for it in the sense that you know there's mandatory education in the state, but you know. And so that's why I'm thinking when people talk about changes, it's really important to try and think about if the change in terms of what the benefits of are of the change. Because currently we do jump through all these hoops for a system which is clearly detrimental to our, um, well, actually, so our 13-year-olds and up. Ms. Voss. Um, yeah, just thinking about what I'm hearing. Um, if we go back to thinking about starting 8, 8.30, and 9, and how the busing could work for that, um, in terms of what plan would you affect the fewest people in a negative way? Um, That's just a fact. The bus ridership at the high school, and this is thanks to the bus study that some of you had done that I've looked at, um, and yeah, maybe it's three, four, five years old now, um, and I, I guess we'd want new numbers perhaps, but the bus, the buses leaving the high school at two don't have very high ridership. They have people who buy the bus pass, but these numbers show these buses are less than half full typically. And so if you move to this model of switching the bus time just out of the high school to accommodate JFK and the elementary schools ending um, on the new proposed time, then you could still start the elementary school closer to nine and it maybe really wouldn't affect as many people. And maybe the question to the school councils and the parents is how many people are relying on these high school buses at two? And in fact, I'd go to so far as to say there might be high school students riding the buses home at two who would rather be staying after school but have no ride home at four. And um, it might really serve them well to be able to stay there. And I don't know the answer to that, but maybe there's some extra good that could come out of a model like that and really not have as big an effect on all of the, the families in our community. So that sounds like it's a, se a separate question to ask the high school. <laughs> uh, the high I, school I, I appreciate it's a separate proposal, and I, I also. No, I, I just meant it's a separate question yeah, to ask. I also the appreciate school. that we want to not make too many complicated proposals, but I've been thinking about this a lot, and I really, I feel like the least you could t move the elementary schools, right? If you change them by five or ten minutes, that just feels different to me than by the whole half hour later, and. Even if you started the high school at 8 and JFK at 825, it's those high school buses at 8 that need to get the elementary school kids. And I'm not convinced you'd have to change their time. And you know, if we could figure out a way to do that, it just keeps more people happy. And I agree, you're not going to make everyone happy. There's going to be people who need the high school bus in my model at 2 who are not going to be happy. But it may be a fewer number of people that are inconvenienced. Mr. So just a reminder, uh, the discussion tonight was on the 30-minute move, and so I think just so that the community knows, and if there's a, a new upwelling of discussion around what the school committee discussed at its March meeting, was this idea of moving 30 minutes. And so as we're collecting information from people that we're seeing out in the community, grocery stores, phone, whatever, if we could gather the data around Ms. Hennessy's proposal so that when we come back we can get a feeling for where the community is around this instead of adding in a few other tweets because as you can already tell from our discussion tonight we there's some there's a lot of ideas out there for sure and coming up with a hybrid is going to be really difficult but this one seems to be the one that's come forward right now and I'm really interested to hear from uh, my folks in my ward and the people that I come in contact with to see if this is something that we can move forward with. Um, and it seems like this is something that could happen as soon as um, the fall or, you know, soon thereafter if we can get support and move it forward because the change seems to be relatively easy to do and straightforward and easy to understand for folks. So then my question is, so um, you would I feel like I've been tasked to go back to the school councils, let them know that this discussion took place and that the committee is seeking their input. Okay. Ms. Fallon. I was just going to say, based on things that have been mentioned tonight, I think it would be helpful when it goes to the elementary schools for those parents who do utilize the before school programs to know if those programs would be willing to move up on their coverage because I think that's really going to affect people's answers. So it would be nice going into it if the school councils knew if it was even a possibility for those before school programs to 
you mean move up with their coverage or stay with their current Extended. coverage? Ex Extend, extent, right, yeah, extend to the, because I can't imagine you're going to get a straight answer from parents without them knowing if they're going to have a gap in coverage. So basically a 30 minute extension. Thank you, Ms. Hennessy, for, uh, for sparking tonight's discussion, and, um, and we'll, we'll, to be continued. Next, we have our annual vote on the 2019-2020 district calendar for the upcoming school year. And um, I would, I guess, ask Dr. Provost to just give us an overview of uh, what that looks like. So this calendar has been developed by the administrative leadership team and sent to NACE for their review for contract um, compliance and actually does uh, take into account a request we received to make a modification to the um, professional development days prior to the opening of school so I just want everybody to know that um, so under this proposal new teacher orientation would begin on August 22nd and 23rd August 26th would be convocation and a professional development day August 27th would be a teacher work day and August 28th would be the first day of school for most most students August 28th and 30th would be kindergarten orientation and then on September 3rd kindergarten would begin the last day of school would be uh, June 12th with five potential makeup days bring us to June 19th um, obviously with a lot of additional padding in there for more than five snow days if necessary so that is the proposed calendar for the FY 1920 school year okay Ms. Burnham I just have a question um, one of the things that a number of people always ask me about which is the um, high school orientation and on the calendar we always have the kindergarten orientation listed right in August and I wonder if we could add the high school one it's one of um, JFK has a different orientation method but the when you start as a freshman at the high school it's actually I I could get that date from the principal and add it to the online posting. I think that would be really helpful for families. Thanks. And maybe if we move forward, mm -hmm. that we always have it on the calendar. Okay. Can I say one other thing? I'm so sorry. The other thing that I would um, ask is that if there was any chance that we could start making the calendar decisions earlier um, in the year for family because again that's another thing a lot of I, I think that the office has been contacted I know that I've been contacted by people saying what's the first day of school and if we could start doing you know people's camps I mean it, it really starts early <laughs> There is a chance I actually have shared that feedback with the ALT because we have had several calls in our office about first day of school. So our goal will be to bring it forward earlier next year. Great. It's lost. Um, okay, so um, school committee members received um, an email just sharing with them um, a resolution regarding that Northampton passed now not quite three years ago regarding Indigenous Peoples Day and I, I do want to share this came to me in the fall through my neighbor um, she asked she she emailed me and said why is it Columbus Day on the menu and uh, on the menu excuse <laughs> me on the on the calendar and the way it showed up on her computer she couldn't see that it said Columbus Day slash Indigenous Peoples Day and I emailed Mayor Narkowitz um, some questions and he said oh you should bring that up when the calendar comes up so that's how this came up um, for me and then Dr. Provo shared with the rest of the committee that indeed the school committee had discussed this um, something that Ms. Hennessy had brought up in June of 2016 and I did rewatch that today so I'm up to date with the rest of you um, but this neighbor of mine is the woman who spoke tonight and um, I think she said it far better than I can it's it's a real passion but um, she really has sparked an interest in this for me since we had our conversation in October and I've, I've paid pretty close attention to it and listened and when I went to the workshop by real racial equity and learning in Northampton um, they started and it was really profound by just acknowledging that we're sitting in this building on this property that was you know essentially taken 
in aggressive ways. And, um, and, and while we don't have methods for reparations, it just acknowledging that that happened is a first step. And so when this came up, I, I'm just, I, I guess I want to propose that we eliminate this term Columbus Day and just refer to this as Indigenous Peoples Day. That, that's, I believe, what our non-binding yet resolution from our city council encouraged um, when they um, passed it almost three years ago. And um, I'll just add that there's a group, Indigenous Peoples Day Massachusetts.org, and there are five communities in Massachusetts who celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day and, those, those, and, and have uh, resolutions, Amherst, Cambridge, Brookline, Somerville, and Northampton. And in every case, except for Northampton, the school calendar only says Indigenous Peoples Day. And I think we should follow them. Um, I, I'll, I'm just happy to fill in a little bit because I was part of the discussion at the city council level with this. Um, yeah, they, they certainly, uh, I mean, well, Northampton has never celebrated Columbus Day. Oddly enough, we celebrate Pulaski Day. <laughs> uh, October 10th is Pulaski Day, and that's when we have the Pulaski Day Parade, and it's like, and I, I issue a proclamation proclaiming it Pulaski Day. So I think um, that's I mean, when people, who s so we certainly don't celebrate it. There's not a large enough, I guess, Italian American community, and we don't have a Columbus Day Parade, and we don't, so it's, it's to me, it's, and then the other piece of it is obviously, um, Columbus Day is, is a state holiday established by the legislature. So they're really the ones, maybe when they fix the state seal, they can work on this one. Um, they could eliminate, uh, they could make the change. Um, so I, you know, I don't really, eat, um, by taking away Columbus Day, I don't think it, we don't actually have the power to undeclare Columbus Day a state holiday. We don't, and, and the um, and the city council doesn't. I think it's just trying to make a statement about it. So I, I don't know that it's critical that we continue to use Columbus Day on the calendar or not. I mean, so I, I don't necessarily have an issue with it. Um, Cause I, and I frankly don't know that people um, uh, view it that way, but Ms. Hennessy? Yeah, I mean, so that three years ago, we brought it up and talked about it. And I think it's, a, you know, for me that was a step um, I looked at Cambridge's um, calendar. They don't. They just have Indigenous People's Day. I think it's the right thing to do um, for me. Um, that's my perspective to remove Columbus Day. I'm not not declaring it, but we declared an Indigenous People's Day. I think it's a great opportunity for for classrooms to talk about it. But I th I believe we should remove it from the calendar. Um, that's my, and I think some people might be angry with it, but like Mr. Downey said, uh, that's okay for me. So that's my perspective on it. And there I mean, there's even some communities who said get rid of the holiday altogether yeah. and make election day a holiday. That that's what some are that that on the agenda. Mm -hmm. There's some communities yeah. um, that have proposed that, or maybe it's getting rid of President's Day and making election day a holiday. So there's lots of different ways to. It's like we're in the late start discussion again, moving, <laughs> moving holidays around, switching holidays. And, but um, but uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this issue? Um, Ms. Busansky. Well, uh, thank you for you know that explanation or additional information. I was really moved by the our you know public speaker today, and and of course I've heard a, I've heard a bunch of that before, but I think she really made the case for to me really compelling about why we should I guess call this second Monday of the month is that what it is Indigenous People Day on our calendar. So i you know I would like to uh, I agree with the movement towards getting rid of Columbus Day on the calendar. Just indigenous people. Well, I think the easiest way to effectuate that would be for someone to make a motion to approve the calendar um, with the, you know, minus Columbus Day on the calendar. I'll just offer a comment before we do that. Um, I'm actually, if I'm going to actually vote to leave it the way that it is, Columbus Day slash Indig Indigenous Day. Um, I, it's one of ten federal holidays. Um, you know, on our calendar, we have Independence Day, we have Labor Day, we have Memorial Day, 
we have New Year's Day, we have Christmas Day. These are the 10 holidays as they've been defined and outlined through the federal government. Um, I have no problem whatsoever, whatsoever with having Indigenous Peoples Day added on. I, I think what um, Mayor Narkowitz said is very true. I'm a lifelong resident of Northampton, and if you ask me as a child, on the second Monday of October, what do you do? And what do you celebrate? I mean, we celebrated, you know, Kashmir Pulowski Day. And for me, that day was more about the parade and the celebration and going to my church and having a banquet over on Holly Street than it was about celebrating anything to do with Christopher Columbus. So um, for me, um, recognizing it on the calendar as what it's designated by state and federal law to have Columbus Day acknowledged for that day off for um, municipalities and, and city and government officials, to me just seems like what it is. To add the Indigenous Peoples Day on there also to me seems fine as well. It's an opportunity to, and I've said this before, if you go back and watch the um, video as I'm sure that you did when we had this discussion. I come from a family of farmers. Um, my grandfather tilled the land down in the in the Northampton Meadows. Uh, I still go down there and I feel really peaceful when I'm down there. I, I feel a presence of the people that uh, were here before I was. I have a wonderful collection of Native American arrowheads that my, my grandfather found in the fields. I, I feel a strong connection to those folks that as uh, Dr. Voss said, you know, whose land, this was rightfully theirs before any of us were here. I totally get that. Um, what I have a concern about is the idea that on other federal holidays that we might want to add another name on to acknowledge something that's important to our community and people as well on other federal holidays. Um, if we want to do that, I'd be willing to have a conversation and talk about Independence Day and maybe what we might want to also put on our calendar or Labor Day or Memorial Day or Christmas Day or whatever it is, but add on to it and not take away from. And so that would be my reason for voting against taking off the Columbus Day, not because I don't support the Indigenous Peoples Day portion of it, but to acknowledge that on calendars, state and federal calendars, you're going to see Columbus Day because it's been designated by the government. Um, I'll have Ms. Voss respond and then Ms. Fallon. Thanks, yeah, um, I'm sorry you weren't here to see Laurel Davis Delano and, and or hear what she had to say, but I won't be able to be as articulate as she was, but one of the things that really struck me is just more recent interpretations of history, what a really horrible um, person Columbus was. And so we have this name on our children's calendar of somebody who came here and behaved in all the ways that we try to teach kids not to behave. And so I think just that name being on that calendar, um, a lot of people find offensive. And um, it makes a statement that says we value how we treat each other, we value um, things like this position for equity. You know, when we celebrate something about Columbus Day, um, we're sending a message. I, I, I know our teachers teach the more modern way of thinking about Columbus Day, but I just don't think that name belongs on the calendar anymore given how, what we know now. It's valid. I'm, I'm really torn, I have to be honest, um, between being aspirational and being um, reflecting what is, in fact, the state holiday. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I love that Indigenous Peoples um, Day is on the calendar, and I am happy with removing Columbus Day once it is removed by an act of the legislature. But in the meantime, it seems strange to me to just remove something from the calendar that factually exists and is celebrated as such at the state level. Do you know what I'm saying? Because at that point then, at what point do we stop representing reality? You know what I mean? Like I'd, I'd rather fight to have this change made um, 
so that it's, you know, like you said, we're celebrating Election Day or, you know, and not celebrating this at all. But as long as it is on the, the calendar, like, as long as it's celebrated as such, it seems strange to me to kind of remove that representation. Do you know what I'm saying? To, to just kind of ignore things that are true, like that are... F yeah, and, and I, as I said, I think I've, I've learned a lot about this. So what I've learned is um, it is up to the state. Federal holidays don't matter. There's a lot of states that don't um, acknowledge Columbus Day. I've seen anywhere from five to 24 states listed on lists that don't acknowledge Columbus Day. Where I grew up, we didn't even get off from school for it. Um, at the state level, you're right, but the state doesn't do everything right. We see it con right now we have um, an issue where hopefully the state seal will be changed on our flag. And there's, again, people on both sides of that, but there's clearly precedent in our state. There's nothing illegal about um, not calling this Columbus Day on a school calendar. Um, other communities have done it, and I think our community, through the city council and the resolution that they passed, basic, through our elected officials on city council, said this is not something that we're proud of and that we, represents us, and I think we should go ahead and be done, remove it. Okay. Um, Mr. Coffin, have the next hand, and then come back over here. Um, we've left out July on purpose. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I understand. There's also a typo on November 28th and 29th. Um, but that's not really why I raised my hand. So um, we, I think we, I think uh, December 25th is, Columbus, is uh, Christmas, right? And, and we actually have, it, it, it seems to me like we've already made some precedent of taking out a state holiday and a federal holiday by not naming Christmas, Christmas Day, uh, in, in just countering some of the points that people have made that we can't do this or we shouldn't be doing this. In my mind, I know that we could, we have it in there as holiday recess, but in every other calendar it says Christmas. So I think that previously we have already done a removal of a state holiday. Um, I just want I, I just wanted to point that out that it's not like we, it's not like we haven't done it before. There was some serious discussion about it in the past, but it's not the first time we've done this. Um, and I hear some of the reaction, but I think if this is important to people, as, as several people have brought up and we have to debate it each time, then we probably have to debate it each time. I, I'd rather do that and I'd rather uh, debate it and make, make decisions about things that are obviously outrageous to some people, uh, more so than others perhaps, and, and, that, and go from there. The only thing I'm hesitant about, I, I'm kind of excited to make a decision and not, and not debate this to death, but I do feel a little bit like we owe it to the community, it wasn't on the, the agenda specifically, and I kind of feel like we owe it to open it up, and I know I'm opening up a can of worms by saying that, but I, there's part of me that feels like um, we need to make that decision at next meeting. So, if, in case anybody feels uh, really strong about opposing it, that we give them that opportunity to do so. And I bite my tongue, honestly, as I say it. I'd much rather vote on it today, but it doesn't feel like um, responsible enough to do that. And then the, I mean, the only other thing I would say is that, that then that has implications for when we approve the final school calendar. So. And we've already heard that people think we're already too late in approving it. So that would just be my Okay, I mean, I, w I would say technically we can probably approve it with a one caveat for next time. But we can approve the dates. Yeah. If that's helpful, we can approve the dates and debate the name at next time. Just as an idea. I don't think we're, I don't want to hold anybody up. For sure. So um, there were a lot of hands. So Ms. Busanz, yeah. you had a hand? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, I just, I think... You bring up an interesting point, Ms. Vaughn. I think that this is how change happens. And I think we've done plenty of things. You know, we ban plastic bags. And now, look, we have the state considering banning plastic bags. I mean, this is how change happens. Massachusetts passed gay marriage. Look, our whole country is now gay marriage is legal. Hurrah. I mean, there's lots of ways that municipalities, cities, towns affect change. And this is the beginning, I think, of we're seeing a wave of people saying that they reject what Columbus did and they reject naming a holiday after him and it is time to move to a different name and if that's indigenous people's name day then i feel at peace with that and so that's really why i think this is important it's not about reflecting reality we sell marijuana federal government would tell us that's illegal as a matter of fact they have so you know but i don't know we legalized it in massachusetts so there's plenty of ways that we differ and so i don't follow the i don't believe the federal state holiday is has to be some guidepost that we have to follow no matter what our beliefs are so 
I just have a quick comment. Okay. And Ms. Burnham and yeah. then Mr. Zahowski. Um, my quick comment is um, I think that I, I, I do support changing the name, um, but actually, but my concern about it is sort of policy. And um, we have a policy around, we're, we're developing, we're working very hard to make a policy around naming schools and trees and buildings. And I'm curious how this fits into a policy. And that, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of just tossing that out and I don't know how it, how it does, but how do we begin to make decisions and when do these things get changed and things, so. Dr. Perlost. If I could throw out um, an option for the committee, because I'm concerned with make, giving our community some clarity on when school starts and ends, which is really the main purview of the sc school committee in reviewing the calendar, making sure it has 180 days and the five extra days. We could pass the calendar tonight with October 14th to be determined. We could post that and then at a, f a future meeting we could change, you know, we could decide what we're going to call the 14th. That way families would be communicated to about the start and end of the school year. Okay. Mr. Zahowski. So I would offer the recommendation based on something I heard Mr. Kaufman say a, a few minutes ago. Um, the change moving away from identifying Christmas Day as Christmas and having it as winter recess or holiday. Um, I see the second Monday of October as a state holiday. I don't know how people would feel about it. It's very bland and generic, but we could call the second Monday, just have it on the calendar as a state holiday. I mean, that's what it is. It's a day off from school. It's a state holiday. It doesn't have Columbus's name on it. It doesn't have indigenous people's name on it. I certainly get that. But people are going to go out and acknowledge the day in the way in which they were going to acknowledge it. It's a day off on the school calendar and it's labeled as such. Ms. Voss. I, we all got it in the email. I'll just remind us all. Our city council passed a resolution that says the second Monday of October in Northampton should be called Indigenous Peoples Day. But, but our city council doesn't have that authority. It's an aspirational, it, it, okay. it would be an ordinance. If they had the authority, they'd pass an ordinance and I'd sign it. It's, and they don't have authority over the schools. That's right. So, no, that's right. so when you say our city council handed down to us, we're actually parallel. We're the school committee, they're the city council, the twain shall never meet. Like, like they don't interfere in our work and we don't interfere in their work. So that's why we have a separate elected body that mirrors, you know, the same makeup. So, I, you know, so they did say we urge, we recommend, but I, I, I'm often having to defend the independence of the city, of the school committee to the city council. So, that, I mean, just because, again, I fully support what they wanted to do and they are proclaiming that that day is, they would like it to be known as Indigenous People Day, but, um, but they didn't you note that they didn't say that, and you must remove all mention of Columbus Day and any, anywhere. I mean, so anyway, just like I issue a proclamation every year that uh, that declares the day is to be called Pulaski Day. So I actually like, I like that. I mean, what if you were to just say Indigenous Peoples Day slash state holiday? Would that be a problem? <laughs> It's another idea, but <laughs> I'm just saying, like what, like drop Columbus Day, <laughs> just say state. It's a state holiday. It's it's we're not going to say what the state holiday is called, like but we're also calling it Indigenous Peoples Day here in Northampton. Oh, sorry, so, uh, Ann. hybrid of your hybrid. <laughs> <laughs> I love the hybrid of the hybrid. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say though, three years ago we voted to add Indigenous Peoples Day. I don't think in our policies on naming will saying let's take away all the names we've already named before. Mm -hmm. But I think for this one, I love the hybrid of the hybrid. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's, mm -hmm. um, I like Indigenous so People's Day slash state holiday. holiday. That works for me. Yeah. That's, that that works, works for me. And I think we should vote on it because I do want to get it over with. And I, I agree. And I just think I this is what we're changing. We're doing the dates mm -hmm. and we could hear flack or not and change it. But mm -hmm. 
Ms. Fallon. Okay. I would just ask that you all remember this moment in like a few <laughs> minutes when we talk about the naming policy. This is exactly why we want to stop naming things after right. people because with historical perspective you run into this issue and I love the hybrid of the hybrid and it's not that I don't absolutely support Indigenous Peoples Day. I just wanted to raise the point that it is a state mm -hmm. holiday. So that was that was that was all I was looking keep to do. So I could get behind this. So we're not <laughs> implying yeah. that it's a state holiday. Well, maybe, uh, so can I make a motion? Please. Um, do I need to amend the previous one, or just no. I guess make a motion? The motion would be to um, list on the school calendar the holiday in October, whose date is now blacked out. Sorry. The second Monday. The second Monday, yes, of next year, to list it as Indigenous Peoples Day slash state holiday. Second. Um, any further discussion on this? All those in favor of approving the calendar as with that amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Um, that was some excellent sausage making we just did. <laughs> excellent. We, it's perfect. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the distribution of the FY20 budget book which uh, doc is, is at your table, and I believe Dr. Provost will walk you through. Yes, just hitting some of the highlights. I'll also <laughs> point out that tonight we had hands-free tweeting once again, so this is now posted on the website for those of you who are watching and want to follow along at home. So um, first I'll point out superintendent's budget message, paragraph number four, because it's been highlighted by one of the members as particularly compelling. So if you can only read one paragraph in the superintendent's budget, that may be the one um, to look at. Um, next, going to tab one, see the requested appropriation, 30743000 $780, that represents a 3.5% increase in the Northampton Schools budget. Uh, tab two is the first few budget, which you've seen already. On tab three, and all of the individual cost center tabs, I will point out that the fourth column shows the additional FTEs that are in the FTE in the uh, first three budget. So tab three is Bridge Street. There's an increase of 1.2 FTEs. That's a full-time tier support position and a 0.2 ELL teacher. Where, where are you referring to there? Tab. I'm on tab three, three pages in. Gotcha. The notes column? Or the proposed column. Proposed. It's at the bottom very bottom ah, of the column. I do now, thank you. And that's the same convention in each of the tabs. Yeah. So moving along to tab four, which is Jackson Street, three pages in, you'll see that chart again. Here, there's one PCA, it really is 0.67 because 0.33 of that position is already there, and a 0.4 ELL teacher, ESL teacher. In tab five, which is leads, again, going through pages in. You see here there are reductions as well as additions because this reflects moving one of the preschools from leads to the high school. So you see the reduction of the preschool, ES, two preschool ESPs and a preschool teacher. Those are not reductions in staff, that's just moving from one cost center to the next. Um, and the addition of a tiered specialist. Um, I'm flying through this right now just to highlight things, but I should point out that every tab begins with a description of the cost center. Um, those are really interesting reads and, and tell a lot about what's been happening at the schools over the course of the year. The next John, tab... Are all those changes you just reviewed this consistent with what you presented to us last week? Yes. Nothing changed since then? No changes. Okay. There's one thing coming up that I failed to mention last week, which I'll point out when we get to it. Okay. Um, so tab six is Ryan Road School. Their profile is three pages long, so you go to four, the fourth page and you'll see the staff FTEs. And it's one and a half staff. Um, there's an additional um, half-time 
academic support teacher, and there's an additional ESP. I didn't talk about ESPs in the last um, in the first few budget because they net out to zero. There are two ESPs added at the elementary schools, but there are two ESPs removed from the middle school, so um, it's no impact to the budget. Just again, moving staff from one cost center to the next. Um, tab seven, JFK Middle School. Three pages in, you can see their staffing sheet, and that's where you can see the reduction of the two ESPs, but you'll also see, see the inclusion of half of the 504 coordinator, that's a split position between the high school and JFK, so half of the position is reflected in both cost centers. The two math interventionists, the one special education teacher, and the point four ESL teacher. You can notice that um, they appear in two columns because the proposal is to put some of those positions within the um, appropriation and some of those within other funds within the budget, but they're all there. Tab eight is the high school. And they have a two-page sheet because they have more line items than anyone else. Um, and they have sort of the most complicated piece because they have lots of partial positions and they also have the preschool moving in. So you see the other half of the 504 coordinator, the additional math teacher, the .5 innovation pathway coordinator, the .5 um, uh, transition coordinators all the way at the bottom, the addition of the 0 .7, 0 .17 music teacher. There's a reduction of an interpreter because that was moved to another um, source of funding. And then you see the staff from Leeds, the two pre-K ESPs and the one pre-K teacher. Tab nine is athletics. Um, page four, I think, is my favorite page in the athletic cost center budget is the one I look to when I'm um, trying to sort of take it all in at a glance. This shows the FY20 athletic budget from all sources of funding. Um, and I would just like to add one little piece to what I had said about uh, the athletic budget at the last meeting. I talked about the $13,000 as being um, sort of just the cost of living increases of, of continuing to run the program. One thing that contributes to that is our uh, our athletic fees are down because we're getting more students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch at the high school participating in the athletic program so that reduces the income we receive from athletic fees so that has a that has part to do with that tab 10 is student services they have a lengthy profile because of the many programs and services they provide. So five pages and gets to their staffing sheet. You can see the additional clerical position and the reduction of that 0.33 BCBA that I discussed, which was formerly in the Special Education Cost Center, but now will be in the Jackson Street Cost Center. Tab 11 is maintenance. And here is that, that um, oversight that I wanted to point out. If you go three pages in, you can see there is an additional floater custodian position. Um, that was created with reductions to, the other, to some other line items within the maintenance cost center. Um, we have difficulty not only um, finding and keeping custodians as we pointed out in discussions prior, we also have difficulty getting substitute custodians. Um, so the floater position is there in anticipation that we're going to continue to experience high turnover in the custodian ranks and we want to have someone who we're able to deploy to different buildings to cover the vacancies as they come up. So. John, I'm sorry, yes. how would that person, where would they be, like on a regular, if there wasn't, if one day all schools had everybody? So, um, I don't know if that's something you might have talked to Tony about. I did talk to Tony. There's one of those things that there's always a need at that's one of the schools. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So in um, tabs 13 and 14, I don't think there's really anything to note. I mean, it's all important to read, but as we're quickly walking through. The next thing I want to point out is in section 13, we have some new pages this year. So this is Emmy's sort of beginning to put her own imprint on the budget book. Um, so hard without page numbers to direct you to them, but if you go in one, two, three, four, Seventeen pages to that tab. Um, you should find a price that's a page that's called school price equity calculations. School lunch price. School like school lunch price yep. equity calculations. This is a new um, page in the budget. It shows the impact of the proposed increase, ten cent increase. Ten cent increase in lunches would be. The 275 is the current price. The second page that I put in it is with the proposed price increase of the 10 cents, 285. So that's just more information on how that would play out. And then two pages after that, you can see our projections for food service meal revenue for the FY20 budget. And you can see that um, we're estimating that we would net an additional $8,000 from the price increase in lunch. Uh, again, that's in the context of having an $18,000 increased deficit, so this is just looking to offset a portion of that. We are also in this budget asking the school committee to increase subsidy to the lunch, school lunch program so that the lunch price doesn't have to go up more than that. Um, I have a question. Is that a typo or a, on the second page of the school lunch price equity calculations where it says... Um, School year 2018-19, and then with the proposed. Oh yeah. Right. Is that right? Did that right? Yep. I will. So, up. so what's so the proposal is the proposal, but that should say 20. Yeah. Okay. Wait, what? And then the page right after the meal revenue analysis is another new page, also about food services. This shows our reimbursement from the state for oh, our lunches. So that's just more information on how that works. The rest of the budget are um, just updated <coughs> worksheets that you've seen before. Um, so with that, I would send you off to study. Um, <laughs> we haven't had a lot of public feedback uh, on the budget so far this year. Uh, we did have our joint school council meeting on the budget two days ago. I would say the feedback we got from the school councils at that meeting was very positive about what we're trying to do with the budget. Um, two pieces of, three, I think we've received three pieces of written feedback. I'm doing this from memory right now, so I have to correct this. Um, but I think um, we received positive comment on raising the price for, uh, the, the hourly rate for subs, uh, positive com comment on uh, the budget overall and a comment asking if we could get librarians into the budget. So that's that's the book. Thank you, Dr. Provost. Now we turn to our rules and policy colleagues and to talk about the aforementioned policies around naming and memorials, FF, and uh, teaching about alcohol and drugs, IHAMB. I'll turn it over to the chair. Um, yes, so policy FF, naming and memorials, um, is a serious departure from the prior policy we had in place um, and essentially um, says that when the school committee decides to name or rename a building or facility, um, it'll call an ad hoc <coughs> committee to recommend a name and that the name should include the location and purpose of the building or facility. Um, and then the recommended name will be placed upon the agenda for a vote at the next regularly scheduled meeting of the full school day. Um, and as you see with of course, the issues with the calendar, we were trying to avoid situations where we name a building after a person and then from a perspective, um, historical perspective, realize that perhaps that was 
not the person we wanted to name a building after. Um, and then memorials, um, it's suggested that people who wish to honor, memorialize, or commemorate an individual or event create, uh, <coughs> should do so by planting a tree, or creating a scholarship, an endowed lecture or performance, um, and that they can make their proposal to the superintendent or a school principal. Um, and so, yeah, it's a dramatically shorter, simpler policy. I'm not sure what everyone thought of it, but I'd like to move to um, ex move to accept policy FF as amended. Is there a second from Mr. Moore? Any discussion about um, this policy? Yeah, there are there are two typos. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, the last sentence, uh, person. It says, so wishing to so honor a person. I would just say wishing, <laughs> remove that first so. And then it says, it consistent with policies, <laughs> KCD, and the D is missing, KCE. So you would amend your motion to include those corrections? Yes. Seconded. Some Scribner's errors. Yes, Ms. I have a comment. Thank you very much. I think you hit the nail on the head. It's awesome. And I've read the various versions, and I don't know how you know, I think it's really great. Mr. Moore was kind of instrumental in well, I, I did write narrowing our three focus. Pages long first. <laughs> <laughs> ah, good writer. <laughs> Short, to the point, simple. Um, it's all in the revision. Okay. Um, yeah, I do have a comment, though. I think you know the the just to be clear, it's it's always in the implementation of policy where it matters. It's really hard, you know, when when things come up um, because people do you know for really good reasons want to memorialize individuals or honor them one way or another and um, I think that so it's going to be important going forward for everybody to kind of remember that and remember sort of the point is not to keep people from being honored in a public and meaningful way but to try to make sure in fact that it's um, that it also serves our students well. Someone there's a Christopher Columbus High School that probably <laughs> are regretting that. Right? So, um, so that sounds okay. uh, any, any other discussions? There's been a motion made and seconded um, to approve with those amendments. Um, any further discussion? Further? Okay. All those in favor of approving the uh, uh, new policy FF, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, so now move on to IHAMB. Okay. Um, the next policy is a new one. It's policy IHAMB, teaching about alcohol, tobacco, and drugs. Um, it is reflective of um, the changes with Mass General Laws 71.1 and 7196. Um, and was recommended by the MASC in March of 2016. We did make one change to the MASC recommended policy, um, and that was that the curriculum, instructional materials, and outcomes used in this program should be recommended by the superintendent and approved by the school committee because we didn't feel that it was our role as the school committee to approve the curriculum that was prescribed in this case by state law. Um, and, um, and then I would like to move to approve it with the change of um, the cross-reference, J-I-C-H. We recently renamed that policy, and so I think it's uh, our newest policy, iteration of policy J-I-C-H is drug and alcohol use prohibited. And we removed the by students because it actually applied to staff as well. And visitors. And visitors. Um, so, yeah, I would like to move to approve policy IHAMB um, with the change to the cross-reference. Second. So there's been a motion to move that policy forward with those changes, and a second. Any discussion of this policy? Okay, hearing none. All those in favor of approving the policy, um, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so both of the policies are now approved. Any further uh, report from the Rules and Policy Committee? Nope. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll move on to the Business Administrator's Report, followed by the Personnel Report. 
So in your packet was the monthly appropriation report through March 6th. There's a few accounts that have deficits, some transfers that are still in progress, but a few you approved earlier this evening. So that should take care of some of those. Um, in the gifts, we have um, some PTO gifts that have been made. We have a total of four gifts, two at JFK totaling $600. We have two at Jackson Street totaling $881.12. And your two warrants that were signed by your representative in the month of February is also included in your packet for this evening. Okay. Also have personnel report. We have one new hire during the month of February. Okay. In the SP. Thank you very much. Uh, now we move to the superintendent's report. Thank you. We have a lot to celebrate this month. In addition to the Northampton girls basketball postseason campaign for a state title and the return of the high school musical which kicks off tonight, we also had two eighth graders named as National Scholastic Art and Writing Award silver medalists. Congratulations go to Abigail Smith and Lu Lucien Vage for earning national distinction. Additionally, we had 15 more eighth graders who were recognized at the state level for their writing. Our state award winners are Dahlia Breslow, James Hart, Haley Higgins, Ashla Culp, Ali Lynch, Taylor Lynch, Ava Madden, Elia Massiner, Colby Perone, Trey Rivera, Eloise Roberti, Riley Shea, Aquinas Simone, Jenna Wooster, and Samantha Zanvetter. This month, we also recognize four of our teachers as Grinspoon Excellence in Teaching Award winners. They are Leslie Stein, a special educator from Bridge Street School, Caitlin Myers, JFK grade six science teacher, Claire Williams, of course, JFK band teacher, and NHS technology teacher and frequent public commenter, Jeremy Whalen. Um, we can also celebrate the fact that our governor and state legislators have laid concrete proposals on the table um, to improve school funding. In athletics and academic competitions, we accept processes that create many more losers than winners because the experience of competition calls forth the best in our students. But school finance is an entirely different matter, and the goal should be to provide the greatest good for the greatest number rather than groups of winners and losers. I think there's widespread agreement that now is the time to fix the state education formula because the list of losing communities under the current formula has become so long. I think you could include just about every community from our area on that list, but I have a personal experience in Northampton as well as this neighboring community, Holyoke, so I'll focus on what's happening there. Let me start with what the current funding formula got right. The model assumes that high need populations are most costly to educate and they're often located in cash strapped communities that cannot adequately fund their schools. It seeks to provide a threshold of opportunity for all students with the understanding that state revenue is necessary to mitigate between community wealth inequalities. Looking at Northampton and Holyoke, all of those assumptions are correct. When education reform began in 1993, Students of Holyoke experienced much higher rates of economic and linguistic diversity than their neighbors in Northampton. Even though student need was higher in Holyoke, Northampton spent more to educate its students, about 13% more per student. 25 years later, that has changed. Now Holyoke spends about 13% more than Northampton on a per pupil basis, which is right. I can tell you, as someone who worked in Holyoke, it takes more money to educate students in Holyoke. And it was the formula that made that correction possible. At the outset, um, Holyoke received about 50% more in state funding per pupil than Northampton. Now it receives 400% more per pupil. So that money came from the state. The money didn't come from Holyoke because they don't have the money. The problem with the formula is that it's failed to keep pace with the cost of education. As a result, many communities are now in a relatively worse position than they were at the beginning of the process, and inequality is just as large of a problem as it was 25 years ago. In 1993, for example, Chapter 70 supported about a third of Northampton's education budget and 91% of Holyoke's. 
Now it accounts for only 13% of education spending in Northampton and 87% in Holyoke. Not only are both communities shouldering a greater proportion of the costs, the, the um, between community inequalities are even greater than they were in the beginning. For the first several years of education reform, both communities funded their schools at the minimum required amount, known as, you know, 100% foundation. Now, Holyoke is still at the minimum amount, while Northampton has been able to exceed the adequacy threshold by more than 25%. And that 25% makes a huge difference, as every employee we've hired from Holyoke will tell you. And I'll tell you, I feel a little bit guilty about that, um, robbing Holyoke. Um, but as this tale of two cities illustrates, communities are paying more for a system that is even less equitable than when it first got started. This helps to explain why we now have 16 education funding bills introduced since the beginning of the year. The list seems to be growing every day. Um, bills are coming out faster than the, the analysis from our professional organizations. I've done my best to read and analyze um, all of the potential bills and, and think about their potential impact for Northampton prior to next Friday's Education Committee hearing. Um, I'll say the Promise Act is clearly the marquee piece of legislation with support um, from members of both chambers. Uh, I've been pressing three points of the Promise Act with our local delegation and with, through my professional organization. Um, and I just want to point them out because people have asked what our advocacy can be around it. And for me, I think it's around these three points. Um, one is it doesn't specify a timeline for implementation of the Foundation Budget Review Commission recommendations. It doesn't identify a funding source for implementation. And it makes implementation subject to appropriation. Um, as you know, at the last meeting, I handed out a sheet showing the almost quarter of a million dollars of current um, education funding um, programs for Northampton that are not fully funded because they're subject to appropriation. So uh, I think we should support this legislation. I think I'll be supporting it. But I'll be supporting it as a step in the path rather than as a solution um, to the problem. So I think I'm going to be a gadfly supporter. I would recommend um, anyone who's asking for my opinion that they should be gadfly supporters. I'll be asking, what's the timeline? Where's the revenue going to come from? Um, the good part about this legislation is that it commits the legislature to identifying a timeline for implementation. When that comes forward, then I think that becomes the next piece of advocacy that we need to work on keeping, um, holding people's feet to the timeline. Um, and also saying that you, it's really important that you not meet the timeline by taking money away from other education funding programs that are also subject to appropriation. Um, so I'm very happy about the excitement for the hearing. I'm glad that we had some public comments about the hearing at the beginning of the meeting. Um, but I would ask everyone to prepare for a prolonged advocacy struggle. Um, the Promise Act may be the culmination of one stage of the school finance reform process that began with a set of hearings, including a hearing here in Northampton High School that the mayor and I both testified at. Um, but I think we have many miles to go before we sleep on this issue. That's my report. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Provost. Um, we have some future business and meeting dates. The negotiating subcommittee will be meeting on March 18th, 2019 at 4.15 p.m. in the superintendent's office. The rules and policy subcommittee will meet March 25th, 12 noon in the superintendent's office. The negotiating subcommittee will meet again on March 25th, 2019 at 4.15 p.m. in the NHS library. The school committee budget meeting from which is our second meeting of this month, will be March 28, 2019 at 6.45 p.m. here at the community room. And then the negotiating subcommittee is scheduled again on April 3, 2019 at 4.15 p.m. in the JFK community room. Um, finally, we have a uh, request for an executive session um, on the agenda. And I would ask if the vice chair would make that motion so that we could um, vote to move into executive session. Make a motion for an executive session. Request for an executive session under Massachusetts General Law Open Meeting Chapter 30A, Section 2183. Discuss 
to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with the Northampton Association of School Employees, whereas an open session would have a detrimental effect and further details would compromise the reason for going into executive session. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Can I have a roll call vote, please? Yes. 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 Okay. So I'll just announce to the public that we will be moving into an executive session because to hold this discussion would be detrimental to the city's bargaining opposition. And secondarily, I need to announce that we will adjourn from executive session. We will not return uh, to open session. Thank you very much.